بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم مائی نیم از ڈاکٹر سہیل طارق اینڈ آئی ایم کرنٹلی ورکنگ ایز اے کنسلٹنٹ فزیشن اینڈ سینئر رجسٹرار ایٹ بھاول وکٹوریا ہاسپٹل بھاول پور آئی وارملی ویلکم آل آف یو اسپیشلی رسپیکٹڈ چیئر پروفیسر ہارون عزیز بابر اینڈ پروفیسر جارج ٹرجیو اینڈ ہو از دی ایمیننٹ اسپیکر اینڈ آل دی اٹینڈیز فرام دی بہاف آف اور ویری ڈیئر promising and prestigious Pakistan Society of the Internal Medicine. And uh, today's topic is very unique. Uh, the, there will be two talks on uh, 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 blood pressure uh, measuring, uh, by the, uh, measuring techniques by the Professor Munir Zah Chaudhary. And then second talk uh, by Professor George Sturgeo on home ambulatory and office monitoring of the blood pressure. The topics are uh, basic, but yet they are a bit, te- bit technical though. Uh, uh, And first, uh, I will introduce the, the chair, uh, Professor Harun Aziz Babar. He is a consultant cardiologist and the uh, professor of cardiology and head department of cardiology at Nishtar Hospital Multan. Uh, and he has been former uh, consultant cardiologist and uh, associate professor at Chaudhary Praveh Zilahi Institute of Cardiology. Uh, previously, he has, uh, he has also served uh, at King Abdul Aziz uh, uh, Specialist Hospital at Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as consultant cardiologist. Uh, and head division of cardiology. He is MBBS, uh, member of Royal College of Physicians, UK, and member of, college, uh, member of Royal College of Physicians, Ireland. And he is a dip card, uh, cardiology from the Punjab University, and he is also fellow of American College of Cardiology. Uh, so I warmly welcome you, uh, sir. Uh, thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, I warmly welcome you from, from of the Pakistan. Thank you very much. So well. Uh, you are welcome, sir. Sir, uh, the, the, before we, we move on, the, on to the next presentation, first uh, the, we should tell the attendees that uh, there will be uh, pre-test and post-test uh, pools. And, uh, but uh, as there are some new attendees, then we have to uh, show, show you the uh, training pools so you, every attendee should know how to uh, complete it. And uh, the, these will be comprising of some questions and you have to answer them. Uh, these, uh, 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 this session will not be giving any scores or, or any judgment, but, but you have to participate. Participation is mandatory. As all of you know that uh, today is the second session of uh, our online hypertensive course. And uh, uh, all the attendees uh, have uh, this training ball on their screen, I guess. We welcome Professor George for the presentation. Our first uh, eminent speaker who is a very... Uh, uh, dynamic personality and world known uh, world known speaker professor george estergio he is md fellow royal of college of physician and professor of medicine and hypertension at at stride 7 university of athens greek also chairman of stride blood pressure international organization on blood pressure measurement methodology and technology he is also chairman uh, european society of hypertension working group on blood pressure monitoring and cardiovascular variability Uh, he is also World Hypertension League Special Envoy for Blood Pressure Measurement. He is also a member of European Society of Hypertension uh, Guideline Writing Committee uh, for Ambulatory Home and Clinic Blood Pressure Monitoring. He is elected Fellow of Royal College of Physicians, Glasgow, United Kingdom, and has been awarded uh, Peter Slight Award uh, for his excellent and marvelous contribution towards the research, education, and leadership. To his credit, he is the author of more than 320 publications with history index of uh, 66 and more than 32,000 citations. Sir, we are truly humbled and honored to have your gracious presence. Uh, and I warmly welcome you from the, on the behalf of Pakistan Society of Internet Medicine. Uh, sir, please, I request you to please uh, introduce today's topic of your presentation and then we run the pre-test pool. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, thank you very much. So, um, I'm delighted to join this meeting this uh, uh, morning and delighted to be asked to talk about office home and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, which is my topic of uh, clinical research in the last uh, uh, two decades. Um, so, shall we see the poll test and then give my presentation? What do you prefer? Uh, sir, uh, you just yes, yes, now we run the pre-test. 
Okay, thank you very much. So um, I'm delighted to talk about uh, uh, blood pressure measurement methods uh, in this meeting. This is my uh, conflict of interest in relation to this uh, presentation. Um, measurement is a very important aspect of science. You can see here an ancient mechanism found in the uh, uh, Aegean Sea in Greece uh, more than 2000 years ago, making complex measurements. So if you can't measure something, it has said, it has been said that it doesn't exist. If you can't measure it, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. And if you can't control it, you can't improve it. If you, and if you think of these words, these perfectly apply in the case of hypertension. And whenever we talk about uh, diagnosis, about treatment titration, or about uh, blood pressure goals, 130 or 135, we should remember that we need an accurate tool to make this five millimeters difference. And it's quite tricky to do that with clinical blood pressure measurement. And this is because a few, this is why a few months, a few weeks ago, actually, the 2021 practice guidelines for blood pressure measurement had been published, which provide simple recommendations on how physicians should apply the science of blood pressure measurement in clinical practice. You can see this is a, a statement written but by about 40 experts in blood pressure measurement from around the world. So we have three main uh, methods for blood pressure evaluation, office home and laboratory. These are uh, the methods I'm going to talk about today. And let's start about office blood pressure which is regarded as a cornerstone for diagnosing and managing hypertension. And this is because it is everywhere. It's widely used everywhere. We have to accept that in many cases, it is the only method that the, the physician has to make decisions. It is the most well studied, the blood pressure classification the thresholds for treatment initiation, the goals of therapy, all these have been largely based on data from office blood pressure measurement. However, office blood pressure measurement has serious limitations. First, it is the human observer uh, error and bias. Second is the poor reproducibility of its values. Third is that it goes down with placebo, the white coat hypertension effect and the mass hypertension effect. And this is why Tom Pickering several years ago questioned the usefulness of measuring blood pressure in the office. It is important to understand that when we say office blood pressure measurement, if we don't say exactly what we did, we are talking about quite different methods of measurement. You can have auscultatory measurements in clinical practice. Such measurements hugely overestimate blood pressure. You can have automated attended measurements. You take, uh, uh, you get rid of the observer, you press a button, you have only the device. You can have unattended office measurements. You have an automated device, you put it on the patient, the physician goes out of the room and the device takes three or four measurements while the patient is alone in the examination room. And we have also research setting oscillatory measurements very carefully taken in a research lab. These are office measurements, but all of them have different methodology. They have different values and different thresholds and lead to different diagnoses. So it's important when we say we have office measurements, to make sure what type of office measurements we used. And I would like to make a comment about unattended office measurements, which has been used in the SPRINT study and widely used in Canada. And there are several studies showing that this is a very carefully standardized office measurement, but it underestimates office blood pressure. 
And we don't know exactly how lower these measurements are than the conventional office measurements. So if you look at the international guidelines for blood pressure measurement, you can see here, today in the office, we now recommend electronic devices. If these are not available, alternatively, manual auscultative devices should be used. And there is international agreement that in the office, you always take three measurements. You discard the first one and use the others of the last two. And I think it is important to realize that you can't make diagnosis in a single visit. You need two to three office visits at one to four week intervals, depending on the level of initial office blood pressure and the total cardiovascular risk of the patient in order to make decisions. Whenever possible and available, um, the diagnosis should not be made on a single visit unless office blood pressure is too high and there is evidence of cardiovascular disease. And whenever it is possible, and the methods are available, the diagnosis should be confirmed without of office measurements, either ambulatory or home. So when you do office blood pressure measurement and this is low, then you are done. You should do a measure of blood pressure after three years or one year if there are other cardiovascular risk factors. When it is close to the diagnostic threshold, 130 to 160 and 85 to 99, then if possible, you should confirm with hormone ambulatory measurement. And if these are not available, you should confirm with repeated office visits. If blood pressure is too high in the office at the initial assessment, then this needs confirmation within a few days or weeks before treatment is initiated. There is a recommendation to measure blood pressure in both arms. We have to realize this is rarely done in clinical practice. In the unlikely case that there is a significant difference between the two arms, then the arm with the highest blood pressure should be used. Standing blood pressure. We always said that standing blood pressure should be measured to everybody. But believe me, it's a waste of time. And physicians do not have time. So standing blood pressure is now recommended only in treated patients when there are symptoms suggesting postural hypertension. And maybe you should look at elderly and diabetics who have a, a more common uh, orthostatic hypertension. And as I said, for unattended blood pressure, it is more standardized method. It gives lower blood pressure and with uncertain threshold. And again, you need office and home uh, ambulatory and confirmed diagnosis in many cases. So moving now to ambulatory blood pressure measurement, many people would say that this is a great method. You can see here data from our center, a research center. We used ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and home monitoring in all patients. And you can see here in untreated people, we have white coat hypertension 12 or 13%, either with home or with ambulatory monitoring, mass hypertension 10 to 12%. So 25% of our patients, even with carefully taken office measurements in a research setting, in 25% office blood pressure is misleading. Situation is work in intuitive people. And you can see white coat and mass hypertension in our center goes up to 30%. So even with very careful measurements in an office, in a research setting, office blood pressure is often misleading in both untreated and treated people. And it is important to detect white coat and mice hypertension because you can see here, white coat hypertension has low risk, not the same, but close to normal tensives and mass hypertension has higher risk close to uncontrolled hypertension. And most people and most guidelines say that ABPM is the gold standard, the best method for diagnosing hypertension. This is because it provides multiple blood pressure readings in routine activities during 
also nighttime sleep. It can identify white coat and mass hypertension. It evaluates the 24 hour blood pressure control with treatment. And it is regarded as the best method we have today for diagnosing hypertension. So this is my friend Owen O'Brien from Dublin, who actually said, why is that, that we continue to deny our patients ambulatory monitoring? And I'm asking you why? And we know why. We know why the problems are that it's not widely available. Most primary care physicians do not have access to ambulatory monitoring. It is rather expensive. And it takes time for the physician to fit the device, to take it out the next day. It takes a long time for, for the physician. Some patients are, feel discomfort with the device, particularly during sleep, and particularly in repeated measurements. And it's not 100% perfect. You can't make diagnosis in 24 hours. It's the best tool we have, but it's not 100% accurate to make decision for uh, diagnosis within 24 hours. We should remember that ambulatory monitoring should only be used in a usual workday. We need to take 15 to 30 minutes intervals measurements in the day, but also in the night. When the patient ha ha comes back, and 24 hour blood, blood pressure recording is valid when we have at least 20 valid awake, awake readings and seven asleep readings. And the most important information is the word 24 hour average. If 24 hour average is low, this is the primary criterion, there is no hypertension. If it is high, then you can go and look at daytime and nighttime and nighttime blood pressure dip. But these aspects of the recording has inferior reproducibility. Now, moving to home measurements, I'd like you to show a database from 6,500 people folded for eight years, the IDHOCO database. And you can see here, white coat hypertension detected with home measurements has similar risk with normal tensives in both untreated and treated individuals. But look at mass hypertension. Mass hypertension has risk similar to uncontrolled hypertension. And particularly in treated patients, mass hypertension has higher risk than uncontrolled hypertension. Why? Because the doctor does not see the elevated blood pressure in the office and leave these patients untreated. And this is a study we did in Greece with seven, a 20 years follow-up, one third of them died. And you can see in the long term, the only people who have good uh, survival and fewer cardiovascular events are the normal tensives. All other patients with sustained hypertension, mass hypertension, white coat hypertension in the long term have increased cardiovascular risk and risk of mortality. So when home blood pressure should be used? The recent guidelines published a few weeks ago say that it is useful for the initial diagnosis, a small box, and for treated hypertension, a big box. And for initial diagnosis, it can be useful to confirm hypertension, elevated blood pressure in the office, and to detect white coat hypertension. But it's important to show you the indications for treated hypertension and guidelines now say, use it in all treated patients, unless they are incapable or unwilling to perform in good quality or anxious cell monitoring, used in everybody. The method can identify white coat and mass hypertension phenomena, which are common in treated people. It can help you titrate treatment. It can monitor long-term control. It can improve patients' compliance with long-term treatment. I would like you to show you here how the home blood pressure can improve medication adherence. We have data from 25 randomized control trials. And they saw that home blood pressure monitoring provides a small but significant overall effect in improving medication adherence. And if you apply this small effect 
In the total population of hypertension patients, the impact of cardiovascular disease is important. This is why Tom Pickering 13 years ago had called to act and use and reimburse home blood pressure monitoring as we do for diabetes monitor in diabetic patients, because it has the potential to improve the quality of care while reducing costs. I'd like to show you the guidelines of 2021 about devices. For home, we recommend electronic upper arm cuff devices, which have been properly validated. We prefer devices with automated storage and averaging or mobile phone PC internet connectivity. It's good to say that the cost of these devices uh, is becoming low now, it's lost than 100 years, and such devices can last for longer than a decade. We do not recommend wrist devices, oscillatory devices, and wristband cuffless wearable devices for home monitoring. For interpretation, we prefer to have an automated report with averaging. Otherwise, we give a piece of paper for patients to report their home measurements. We ask the patients to take seven day home monitoring, no less than three days and no fewer than 12 readings. We discuss the first day because the first day gives higher and unstable values and calculate the average of all readings. Individual readings, even if they are very high, they have very little diagnostic accuracy and should be ignored. And the average should be lower than 135 over 85. Ideally, lower than 130 over 80. And this is a form we give to our patients. We give the form and tell them in the next visit, a few days before, fill in this form. And Within visits, we advise them in the long term to take duplicate measurements once or twice per week, if they like home monitoring, or per month, if they are not too fun to self-monitor. But home blood pressure monitoring has a weak point, and this is the reporting bias. Patients select which readings they are going to show to the physicians. They tend to discard high readings, not because they cheat, but because they believe that maybe these readings are not representative of the true blood pressure. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot rely in such handwritten reports for making decisions for diagnosis and treatment in our patients. But this bias can be eliminated with electronic devices using automated memory and or PC link or mobile phone link. And home blood pressure telemonitoring is a 24 hour, 21st century solution for hypertension follow up. And you can see here there are several devices, as I said, less than 100 euros and can last for longer than a decade, which can connect to the internet. They can provide you average values and they can uh, provide all the results on the mobile phone and give an unbiased evaluation of the true blood pressure of your patient at home. So the patient can be linked to the pharmacy, to the doctor, and you have an um, objective uh, follow-up and monitoring. So you can see here a meta-analysis of studies on home blood pressure telemonitoring. And the conclusion is that home blood pressure telemonitoring may represent a useful tool for improving hypertension control still more costly versus usual care. But as I said, the cost of such application is being reduced. And this is a study by Richard McManus in UK who actually used self-titration of treatment by patients using home blood pressure telemonitoring. And he concluded that home blood pressure telemonitoring with self-titration can lead to significant lower blood pressure titration. And this should become the cornerstone for hypertension management. It's very important to see what patients say, what they want to do, what they prefer. And I show you here data from two studies. There are two different countries. One is UK and the other is Greece. What's the difference? In Greece, everybody is using home blood pressure monitoring before he goes to the physician. In UK, nobody uses home blood pressure monitoring. 
So two candles with wide use, gris, or rare use, UK, of home monitoring. And you can see in the UK study, 81% of patients preferred home blood pressure monitoring. And they said it's more comfortable to prefer home blood pressure than ambulatory monitoring, 80%. And in Greece, more people have said it is more easy to perform home than monitoring and preferred home monitoring in their next evaluation for hypertension. And I think I'd like to say here that the COVID-19 was a disaster, but also opened several opportunities, which are being now discussed. And one of them is home blood pressure monitoring. I'm showing you four papers from United States from Italy, from China, and they say text messaging and home blood pressure monitoring, smartphone-based application with home blood pressure monitoring, home blood pressure monitoring and virtual care. So COVID-19 will push home blood pressure telemonitoring more uh, fast in clinical use. So this is the 24-hour blood pressure curve. And many people say, well, this is a unique advantage for ambulatory monitoring. Well, yes and no, because there are studies, there are devices, low cost devices, home monitors, which can measure blood pressure during nighttime sleep. And this is a study where we compared an ambulatory monitor for detecting nocturnal hypertension with a home monitor, low cost home monitor. And you can see daytime and nighttime strong blood pressure similar. And there was agreement between traditional ambulatory monitoring and the low cost home monitor who measure, that measured blood pressure during night sleep in 75% in detecting on dippers. 75% is ideal because if you do ambulatory blood pressure monitoring twice, the agreement between the repeated ABPM is 75%. And you can see here studies from Japan, Greece and Finland and you can see the correlations of home and ambulatory nocturnal blood pressure level of glamour synthesis quite similar. Home blood pressure is a valuable tool for research. Let's say that you have two drugs and you want to see which one is stronger. And you want to find a difference in the efficacy of five millimeters of mercury. And you want your study to have a power of 80% milli, 80 chance to find this difference in efficacy of the two, two drugs. If you use office blood pressure measurement, the power of your study is 65%. If you use ambulatory monitoring, your power goes up almost 90%, and with home measurements, even higher. So home blood pressure monitoring, as well as ambulatory monitoring, increases the statistical power of clinical trials assessing the efficacy of antihypertensive drugs. And home blood pressure can help you see the duration of antihypertensive drug action. You know we have the trough to peak ratio, and in this study several years ago, we used the trough to peak ratio with ambulatory monitoring to compare two drugs, losartan 50 and lisinopril 20. We know now that lisinopril 20 is stronger, but at that time, we were told that losartan 50 is the maximum dose. And ambulatory monitoring was clear that so clearly showed that lysinopril had longer duration of action, higher trough to peak ratio than losartan. But if you use morning to evening home blood pressure monitor, you can find the same. So morning to evening home blood pressure can give you same information about the duration of antihypertensive drug action as much as trough to peak ratio with ambulatory monitor. So which method to use? First, use what you have. Second, ambulatory monitoring is more appropriate for initial diagnosis. You put it today, you have the result tomorrow. The result is unbiased and the patient does not train it. But home blood pressure is more appropriate for long-term follow-up. It's more widely available. It is better accepted by patients and improves compliance with treatment. Unfortunately, ideally you should use both. I know you will say it's, it's not realistic, 
but unfortunately these methods are not only competitive they are, they are complementary they give you different additional complementary information of the individual blood pressure behavior and profile so abpm you can use anybody any 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 of these methods for diagnosis and follow-up, but ABPM is ideal for diagnosis. Home blood pressure is ideal for long-term follow-up. Office blood pressure is good for screening with a question mark because it will miss mass hypertension. So what the guidelines say, I think the Americans gave an outstanding recommendation several years ago and said, use ambulatory home measurement, one, to confirm the diagnosis, two, to decide titration of treatment. So they moved the decision for diagnosis and titration out of the office. You can't make decisions for diagnosis or for titration exclusively on office measurements, unless you don't have anything else. And this applies to both untreated and treated, particularly in those people who are close to their diagnostic threshold, office blood pressure 120 to 160, 80 to 100 diastolic, in these patients, office blood pressure does not have the accuracy to diagnose hypertension, and you need to do out-of-office measurements. And you can see here the European guidelines. If office blood pressure is high normal, lower than 140 over 90, you are not finished, you should screen for mass hypertension and need out-of-office measurements. But even if blood pressure is higher than the threshold, then you need to confirm with out-of-office measurements. And only if these are not available, then you should confirm with repeated office visits. But there are barriers for using these methods in clinical practice. For home measurements, there are concerns that, and these are data from the United States. It's important to, 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 to say which country it is. They say that I have concerns that patients may not measure correctly the concerns that may become preoccupied with blood pressure. Device affordability is a problem even in the US in some settings. For ambulatory monitoring, the cost is an issue even in the United States. The time required by the physician, the lack on infrastructure, and the low reimbursement of these devices. But what is important is that in the United States, these studies showed that healthcare providers may lack confidence in their skills and knowledge to interpret home and ambulatory monitoring. So there is a need, a responsibility for all of us to spread the method for how these should be used in clinical practice. I'm moving a little bit now to the end of my talk and I'll talk a little bit about devices. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a miracle. It is amazing that this device, the Mercury device, has survived for a century in the medical practice. No other device has lived so long. Any device that is there out there for several decades goes to the museum. It's amazing that we still have this device. And we have this method of measurements. We have been teaching this method for several decades. And the problem is that there are so many sources of error because the patient have smoked or had coffee. It's not a quiet room. It's cold. He didn't rest enough. He was talking during measurements. He didn't have his back supported on the seat, his arm on composition, his, his legs are, are, are crossed, and, and of course the devices. There are more than 10 sources of error in a single measurement. And I was amazed to see this data again from the United States. I'm not saying anything from my country or your country, this United States. They looked at 160 medical students in 37 states and looked on how, uh, whether they have skills in auscultatory measurement of blood pressure. Only one did it right, only one. Most of them had a score of four out of 11. This is why the recommendations now say, 
automated devices for everywhere, not only for ambulatory monitoring, not only for home, but also for office measurements, but these devices should be properly validated using an established protocol. And these are several devices, professional devices available on the market. These are electronic devices. These are auscultatory devices. They look like mercury, but they are not mercury. They are expensive devices. Believe me, you can use a validated home monitor, which has low cost and has the same algorithm and the same accuracy with these expensive office devices. And we have some protocols. We used to have some protocols, American, British, German, European, to validate, to assess the accuracy of these devices. At last, we have a universal standard agreed by the Americans, the European Strait Hypertension, and the ISO organizations. We, have, we now have a single protocol, and all the devices should use one to tell us whether the device is accurate or not. And if you want to know which devices are accurate, you should go to the Stride BP website. It is supported by the European Society of Hypertension, the International Society of Hypertension, and the World Hypertension League. The problem is that in the Stride BP, only 8% of the blood pressure monitoring devices available in the market have been approved. And you can go there and download the list for validated home devices or office devices or ambulatory monitors. And there are separate lists for children pregnancy because a device which is an electronic device which is accurate in the adults may not be accurate in children in, or pregnancy and separate validation is necessary. I'd like to close a little bit with the cuffless wearable devices which are becoming an epidemic. Cuffless devices, there are too many of them now on the market, and they claim that they accurately measure blood pressure. They have a sensor which evaluates the pulsation of the arterials, and they estimate, they don't measure, they estimate blood pressure using pulse wave velocities or other technologies, and they are a great promise. They are a great promise for screening for hypertension, for long-term monitoring, and so on. And there are several devices. This is the Samsung device. This is the Actea device, and the Freescan device, different devices. Very interesting, very challenging technologies. And most of them use pulse wave-based estimations. Some of them have arterial tonometers but they are different devices. They have special validation issues, which we only recently recognized. They need to have accuracy to test their accuracy. They are calibrated and you need to test that after a few weeks, they're still accurate. They should be tested for retaining accuracy till the next calibration. And we should make sure that they can track blood pressure changes. Blood pressure is accurate now, but what happens if blood pressure goes up? And this universal standard we have, it's not appropriate for cuffless devices. We are now working with the ISO for two years or so to come out with a special validation protocol specific for cuffless devices. So we need a special protocol. And this official statement is that the accuracy and useful for cuffless devices is uncertain and these devices should not be used at the present time for diagnostic or treatment decisions. So I'd like to close you here, to close here with showing you this paper. This paper is free from download. It's open access, you can download it. And more importantly, it has a single page a supplement with a single page, all the practical information, not theory, practice, what to do for office measurement, for home measurement, for ambulatory measurement, for office measurements, data environment, we have to standardize our methodology for diagnos diagnosing and treating hypertension. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so very much, Dr. George. It was just a wonderful talk, and uh, we hope that this updated information uh, will be helpful in our, in our clinical practice. Thank you so very much uh, for your precious time, and it was just exquisite. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Professor George. This is Dr. Bilal Mohideen. Finally, I've been Hello. able to get you to Pakistan, though virtually, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get you in over here in a better fashion. Um, sorry, I could not delighted, join you earlier. Delighted because, to join you. Sorry, I could not join you earlier because of certain family emergencies that came up, and uh, in fact, I'm moving right now also, so to speak. But anyway, um, fantastic talk. As always, I've enjoyed listening to you earlier. Last time I heard you was in Germany, and it was a real pleasure even at that moment. Um, my basic problem with these uh, electronic um, devices that is now actually the need of the R, uh, which we are always talking about, is that um, they don't come in all cuff sizes. So for many people, that becomes a tricky issue. Um, another thing is that um, I've never been really been able to sort of, you know, uh, get to the point of a feel that uh, if you look at a lot of these cuff apparatuses that are now coming up, the, the actual uh, cuff that is inside is on one side of the whole wraparound. It's not centrally placed. And because of that, the whole placement, etc., becomes a challenge. Um, and then again, in those uh, people who are rather on the healthy side, they have right, a conical kind of an arm. And that conical arm then creates another set of problem. And these uh, apparatuses that are old uh, traditional style, that which actually I, I'm the, the, the 100 year old um, uh, apparatuses that you are showing, actually I have one of them and I'm still very fondly using it. And it was used by my late father. And uh, that is uh, probably as old as you are and doing perfectly well. Yes, the, the, the apparatuses, the cuffs keep on changing, but the basic thing is uh, made from uh, Germany. And, uh, but anyway, my, my basic question is, what do you recommend regarding the conical arms and when these, and what kind of a, a cross section that must be covered? Three fourths is what they say, but then everything goes wrong. First, um... Many thanks for giving me these questions. Because I had to talk with three methods, I didn't touch the cuffs, which is a major issue. So I'll give you three lines of answer. One is about the cuff, the other is the obese, and the third is the mercury. About the cuffs, when you are talking about a scaltatory method, things are easy. You need the bladder, the inflatable bladder, to cover 75 to 100% of the arm circumference of an individual. This is the rule for scaltatory measurements. Electronic devices are different, and your comment is very important. Why? Because for the electronic devices, the cuff is an important part of the device. It's an element of the device because it's not only to compress the artery, it's also the sensor of the oscillations. So you can't take away a cuff and put another. Each device has its own cuffs. And so in this case, you don't follow the rule of 80 and 100% for scaltatory. You follow the recommendations of the manufacturer according to the validation studies they have. I have to say that we have neglected the cuff sizes for quite a long time, but it's important to focus on them uh, uh, from now and on. The obese, the obese is a very tricky thing because if when the, the arm, as you said, when the arm goes bigger, it doesn't go like this, go like this. The bigger arm is conic. And all of us have been have seen these difficult short ladies, and, and, and the arm is like this, and the calf cannot. So the ISO regards people with arm size larger than 42 centimeters as a special population, which requires different validation. The good news is that, the, that the good manufacturers, the big manufacturers now have conic cuffs, one. And second is that they come up with some uh, devices which measure blood pressure during inflation, not deflation, which, may, which makes the measurement faster and less painful for these ladies. The last is, I'd like to make a comment about the mercury device. We have mercury devices 
as well in my lab. Why? Because if you develop the best electronic device, which costs 30,005 euros, you bring it to my lab and I'll check the accuracy against the mercury. The mercury remains the gold standard of measurement for any uh, new technology. Uh, one more thing over here. Um, I've always been this bit troubled about the fact that, you know, mercury, yes, of course, it has all of those things, but then it also has a lot of mechanical parts inside it, the diaphragm, etc., which helps it to, you know, move accurately. Um, my unfortunate bit of experience, even with a lot of these mercury apparatuses that either because of the cuff or because of uh, maintenance or because of the manufacturer or whatever, they are not validated. So now the question actually is basically the validation of an apparatus. Um, you know, you have this, this so-called international uh, measurement uh, tool available somewhere in England, I understand, from, which measures what a one meter is exactly. Do we have something like that? Or actually, do we need to sort of uh, validate it against an invasive monitor? And then we can say that, you know, this PP apparatus and this, these things are all accurate. Good questions. Um, first, forget about interactorial measurement. Perfect. Yeah. I, ac I accept that measurement is only interactorial. interactorial. This is the only measure. Oscillator, oscillometry, cuffless, anything. They are not measurements, they are estimations. So interactorial is the true measurement. However, it's different than oscillator oscillometry. The, if you have a pulse pressure like this in the artery with cuff measurements like this. So, so you have to use, if you want to use the guidelines we have for hypertension, you need to use as a reference the auscultatory measurement. So we still have the mercury devices, but there are some devices, electronic devices, which have accuracy accept by the ISO organization as a reference method measurement. In my center, we still use mercury devices as reference to test new technologies, but as you know, it's getting more and more difficult to service these devices. Perfect. And then I just uh, say Blan, once again, Dr. thank Blan, you for please, coming. Dr. And, Dr. And Blan, hopefully, Dr. Blan, yeah, I just, Dr. Yes, Dr. I just please, I'm thanking him and letting him know that Bilal, we please, have more than 250 people have, with us. Dr. Bilal, we have to give opportunity there. Dr. Tariq Vaseem wants to say something. Let him please thank say something. You. Tariq Vaseem, please. Thank you. Thank you for, Mr. George. It's an excellent talk, but uh, there is another kind of device. We have been using it that is called an aeroid type. The spring one and that. And we still have, we in, it is used in quite a, um, uh, say, a lot of people using it. And our uh, economy and all that does not probably allow uh, to be this uh, validated uh, electronic devices to be used, but particularly in the far flung areas and all that. So what do you, uh, where do you place that? Should that be sent to museum as well? The problem with an aeroid device, uh, there are several problems. One of them is that it needs an observer and auscultation. We want to get out to get rid of the observer. However, I realize that in some cases you can't have electronic devices, even in my country, and you, can't, you, can't, you have to use auscultation. Mercury is dead, so there are some aneroid devices which are shock resistant. Are, because you know, most of the aneroid devices have very low quality. And after a few weeks may show different things. So if you have good devices, shock resistant of a good manufacturer aneroid, one. And second, you apply the proper scaltatory measurement, certainly you have, can have reliable measurements, but you need these conditions, a good device, and a good use of the oscillatory method. Uh, Professor George, thank you for the brilliant talk. Uh, we really I, enjoyed it. I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, 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 let me ask him a question first, uh, Dr. Professor Harun Robert. Uh, you have made a point, a very strong point in favor of ambulatory population monitoring. And I just want to ask you what percentage of patients in your real practice, they have this 
test ambulatory blood pressure before they're formally diagnosed as hypertensive and before you start them on medication in the real world? In my center? Yeah. In my center, if you come for a visit, we put you a BPM. <laughs> in my day. center, everybody, everybody who walks in has a BPM. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's not, it, we are a research center devoted in ABPM. So anybody who approaches our clinic as much as possible has everything, but we are a research center. Um, there are, a, when we want to have fast diagnosis, we do ABPM because we put it today and tomorrow we have 70 readings. So IBPM has this unique advantage that the patient does not, does not need training, put the device today, and tomorrow you have a lot of information. So IBPM is fast and uh, does not need training. If you have, it's a useful tool. Home blood pressure takes longer time. You need to train people. Uh, you don't want to involve somebody who may not have hypertension. <coughs> So uh, we use everything, but they have different uses, as I said in my talk. First, Harun, please your comments now. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And I welcome Professor George for an excellent presentation, for a very comprehensive presentation about the techniques and about the outcome, how we measure the blood pressure, how we diagnose it. And what I will uh, try to summarize what the Professor George has uh, enlightened us with, that actually both the home monitoring of the blood pressure and the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, they are complementary to each other. And especially in, in countries where ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is not readily available, home monitoring may be a solution to diagnose the blood pressure as well as to control it and monitor it further for the treatment purpose as well. I think that that's what the message we got today is. Thank you. Yeah. I uh, fully agree. And some people say that it's, uh, some people say it's expensive. We can't pay for these devices, but believe me, think that home blood pressure monitoring can save unnecessary diagnostic tests, can save money from unnecessary treatment. So home blood pressure monitoring can save money in some way. So you have to take that sure. in balance when looking at the cost of using the method. Let's now That's run right. the post-test poll and then we will continue the discussion. Okay, now we can continue our discussion while we prepare the Comparison. I think after this question, we'll continue the discussion. We will prepare the comparison to display. Another one. Thank you, Professor Aziz. What I would like to ask uh, Professor George is that usually when you are doing the home blood pressure monitoring, is it uh, enough to take two, uh, uh, two, two readings, one in the morning and one in the evening? And this is what uh, uh, it is recommended that the morning one should be taken before the breakfast without any tea mm -hmm. or coffee. It, it is amazing uh, how many papers have looked uh, at the home blood pressure monitoring schedule. Really, uh, from my center, we have published something like 15 papers only on that. So on the, the general conclusion is that you should use duplicate morning and evening measurements before drug intake, before coffee. And uh, you should have at least three days monitoring and uh, measure uh, and discuss the first day. This is based on studies of reproducibility and it is based also on outcome studies. The, it doesn't matter how exactly how you take measurements. The most important thing is you need at least 12 readings. Ideally, you should use the schedule, duplicate morning, evening, as you said, before drug intake, before coffee. Thank you very much, sir. I think it was a, an excellent talk. I was totally blown away with the clarity of concepts and 
the way he communicated and way he presented. I just wanted to thank uh, Professor Giorgio for being here and it's indeed an honor to have him as faculty of this course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Professor you very much. Professor Sajid Abedul is also here. Okay, if the, the pre and post test poll comparison is ready, we can display it now. And While we are waiting for these uh, results to um, come in, Professor George, you, you had that trial in which you had a little bit of a comparison between um, uh, the England and uh, the Greece and how they have looked into this whole fact. Um, for our part of the world, the ambulatory and home pressures and all of these things are slightly on the stiffer side. Um, to get a grant uh, to do, go ahead, how do we go ahead and uh, try and you know um, have a collaboration or something like that? So we can also start putting in our patients because climatically we are different and we have our own set of issues. Any thoughts on that? I, I think that the, the, the way to go is to do something on home measurements. Um, if, you, if you design a project on home blood pressure monitoring, um, the devices can have very low costs. You can find devices for something like 30 euros. And as, as I said, they can last uh, quite long. Uh, we also use a model where we have home blood pressure monitors which are 30, 40 euros in our department. So we give them to our patients. So what you might do, you have low cost home monitors and you give them for four days to your patients for diagnosis and you bring them back. So they don't have to pay for uh, buying the devices. So as an initial step for out of office measurement in, in your practice or clinical product, something like this, I would recommend uh, build, developing a model where you have your own home monitors and loan them for a few days to the patient. No, totally out of the context as far as your talk is concerned, just for uh, from a technical angle. And we had this discussion last time, and one of our presenters also, just putting up the same question to you. Uh, how frequently do you check the sodium levels of a patient? And do you equate that with the pressures? And if a patient has got a sodium level less than 135, do you still recommend stopping the sodium? Sorry, I can see you smiling away like this. Yes. You don't know if I disappoint you, but we don't measure sodium in our <laughs> patients. We just instruct them what to do and what to avoid. But um, you know, which center has a, if, if you had an expert here working in research in sodium, who probably would do what I do with ABPM, who'd measure to everybody. But we do not, we do not. And it's not in the guidelines yet you should measure it in all patients. Yeah, that's what you know, I thought the man who writes the guidelines, let's ask him the question. <laughs> We are having the results uh, before. So, I mean, there was one comparison shown. Can, can we go ahead with Please. the rest of the question? Go ahead with the results. We have to move on to the next presentation now. <laughs> we, we showed the results. I think we will be providing you this uh, recorded videos also. We have to now move on to the next presentation. Uh, now, invite sure. our. Uh, uh, now I invite uh, our next speaker, Professor Munir Raza Chaudhary, and the talk is on uh, blood pressure monitoring technique. He's a very well-known personality and uh, is well-known for his uh, uh, excellent professional demeanor. Uh, he's uh, uh, currently working as a professor of medicine at Shahidah Islam Medical and Dental College, and uh, uh, he is also faculty member of College of Physician and Surgeon Pakistan. He's a great educationist and uh, uh, he's a great educationist and uh, a master trainer at the University of Health Sciences and the College of Physician and Surgeon Pakistan. Uh, he's MBBS and uh, FCPS Medicine and fellow in Pakistan, uh, fellow from Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. He's MCPS in Health and Physical Education and also having postgraduate diploma in he, uh, Hospital Resource Management. Uh, sir, uh, uh, I cordially invite you to start your second talk and uh, introduce your topic, and then we'll run a, a pre-test pool. Thank you so very much for joining us, sir. Thank you very much. Welcome, for, uh, Professor. Uh, I think it was a blessing for me that I 
listen to Dr. George. Now I can cut short many, many slides which I had to mention in my presentation. Number two is that we talk much about the intellectuality, about the cognitive aspects of uh, measuring the blood pressure and its outcomes, its consequences, and its impact in various dimensions. Uh, I'll just quote one example. While I was a postgraduate student, I was accompanied by my professor, he was also my supervisor, and there is a talk in one of the towns where we went just for the purpose how to take the blood pressure. And it was surprised after the uh, completion of this presentation that a gentleman came to us and he talked to me that uh, I have practiced for 18 years in this vicinity. But it is now for the first time that I am able to take the blood pressure with the proper protocol. This is extraordinary, very, very sensitive, very, very important topic. Because uh, just going for the outcome, it's better to take the exact figure what we are basically expecting from our patients. This is important, most important, I would say. And uh, before I go to start it, I'll just uh, uh, read one of the themes of uh, 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 this year, which is basically uh, that the World Hypertension Day, people say that uh, measure your blood pressure accurately control it, live longer. These are three, three aspects. We can only control anything if it is recorded properly and accurately. We can uh, only offer longevity uh, that if we are able, able to control the disorder. And we know that basically what happened with the passage of time, that uh, we are heading towards the era of hypertension, diabetes, lightness, degenerative disorder and now COVID-19 and many other infectious disorders face. And especially the people, uh, once they are confined to their home, especially in the lockdown, the people, they have got a change in their eating habits, in the uh, lifestyle habits and everything. And people, they don't come out. They don't have a chance to walk around. They don't have got coming out of the distress as well. That's why there is fluctuation in the blood pressure and intake of medication that is also changing with the pattern is changing with the pattern. So I'll just briefly talk about two, three, four things in, in, in my sir, discussion. Uh, sir, first we have to run the pre-test school before start of the presentation. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if the results would have been more than 90%, I would have quit the presentation. <laughs> but it's quite technical things uh, you might have gone through. Uh, and many participants might be looking at various options, uh, which we usually ignore when we are basically going for this, uh, taking the blood pressure. So at the end of the, uh, this uh, presentation, the participants must be able to know the history of blood pressure measurement, history of manometer and its practical application. This is my basic right. As if I am selling one device and this device is its significance, its application, its benefits, and the threats which we basically come uh, forward once we are going to detect while we are taking the blood pressure. Very simple thing is systolic blood pressure is what the heart actually beats and putting the flow of blood into the arteries. And in this way, we call it as a systolic blood pressure. Diastolic is uh, just after the closure of the left ventricle, what is uh, basically at the level of aorta the pressure inside the blood vessel, which become, you know, relaxed at that time. So this is diastolic blood pressure, totally dependent upon the total peripheral resistance. Coming towards the etymology, why we call it as manometer? This is the instrument, we use it time and again for taking the blood pressure. So spigmo is basically one of the Greek word, which means pulse, and manometer is a French, which means that we are going to check the, uh, by a pressure meter. So these are two combined things uh, which are denoted as a strict moment. Uh, it was basically uh, Rev. Stephen Hales who, uh, who basically took the pressure for the first time uh, in, in one of the horse, rather it was a mare. And uh, he used 12 feet long tube, opened the artery and took the blood pressure. You can see into the, uh, this, uh, this figure as well. And uh, later on, the things was more or less manipulated by two very, very important stories. 
manometer was first uh, uh, basically instrument which was taken into account and it was in 19, uh, 1896 the device was further improved by on <coughs> rivas of e by uh, adding a cuff so that was cuff was basically added at that time and this was uh, used just to take the systolic blood pressure at that now we have talked much in the previous uh, discussion about the manual mercury sphygmomanometer its significance its impact and then the aneroid sphygmomanometer which was basically talked about uh, after the instigation of dr tariq wasim and then the digital portable and non portable and sand filtration methodology which is case of uh, for the purpose of convenience digital and we talked about the validation we talked about the monitoring and calibration of all the instruments and it was ultimately concluded that here the manual mercury which was uh, almost 1 century ago uh, this is still a gold standard uh, basically used in the now coming towards the uh, this bladder size i just want to show you that the american heart association recommend progressively larger cups with larger arm circumference in case of arm, arm circumference 22 to 26 which is considered in small adults and uh, the cup size is 12 into 22 these figures are very very important to consider dr bilal muhyiddin also talked about the cup size especially in the digital meters which is not readily available and there is usually a standard size which is uh, equipped and we don't expect that it is always going to give a very dated result similarly about the arm circumference about the adults 27 to 34 cm is considered as the arm circumference and then the uh, adult cup size is 16 in 30 similarly arm circumference in case of large adult one big body So 35 to 44 centimeter is considered as the arm circumference, and 16 to 36 centimeter cup is the large. Arm circumference uh, 45 to 52, and then uh, coming uh, this yes yes this is basically considered to be the adult thigh, and the cup size is 16 to 42. Children require smaller cups depending upon their size. So keeping in consideration all these things. one important uh, uh, the, the dilemma is that if we are going to use the smaller cup on a big circumference of the arm we are likely to have blood pressure which is not considered to be uh, as as normal because it will record high and similarly if we are squeezing the arm with a big bladder then definitely we are going to get less blood pressure which was expected with the normal size cup then coming towards the cup position if the bladder within the cuff doesn't completely encircle the arm particular care should be taken to ensure that the bladder is placed over the brachial artery and the lower edge of the cuff should be approximately 2.5 cm which is almost 1 inch above the antecubital space in extremely obese people a thigh cuff may be used with a white bladder folded on its now how we decided uh, i think if we have got a person with a, a big arm then we can use even the measuring tape before we apply the device which we never consider for anything any anybody because we are always in emergency we ask a person you show me your uh, arm and they we are we going, uh, going to wrap it up and if it is not being tightly uh, you know this uh, taken up over there then uh, another person is asked to hold it and then we go on it so this is unfair so we have to have different kinds of cups with us number one and number two is that if at all it is dire needed then we must use the uh, this measuring tape before we apply and getting the validated result now cup position in extreme sorry uh, sorry dr professor muni can you speak a bit louder because audience are complaining that your voice voice quality is a bit on the lower side so if you could move a closer to the mic it would be easier for the patient okay thank you very much and as you also uh, please I'll... check the connectivity so that that is more audible to the more clear and more audible uh can you listen me now uh, i mean properly dr somia can you listen me yes. sir i can listen you but four five sir, participants is there any possibility for you to move closer to your system i am very close to my system okay. now now i I'll, i'll i'll speak louder 
Maybe request okay. rest of the audience to mute their uh, say mics as well. Yes, there are. There all are panelists and all attendees, please mute their mics so that the speaker is clearly audible to everybody. Thank you. So I was talking about the size of the calf, as was talking about the position of the calf, and similarly, I I uh, now put great stress on a person when you are going to examine the blood pressure of anybody, it's always advisable that the person must hold the forearm on a table so that it should not be hanging around. Because uh, if a patient has got you know, this uh, arm hanging alongside the body, then the blood pressure is definitely different as compared to a person who is resting the forearm on the table. So I have given you one of the figure if the patient is sitting comfortably, he is using the back of the chair and legs are not crossed and he is appears to be comfortable. His arm is at the size, at the uh, exactly, uh, uh, exactly at the side of the heart, just by the side. And similarly, he is holding the forearm on the table. So these four or five things are very, very important. Similarly, once you come across a patient for taking the blood pressure, it's always advisable in your clinic that the patient should come in and should keep waiting for at least five minutes before you are heading towards the taking of the blood, blood, blood pressure. Because if you are not asking the person to take rest, the chances are that he is coming directly. And uh, sometimes the clinics are uh, uh, definitely to be reached by certain steps as well. Uh, patient, they are rushing. Patient, by, uh, patient might be, you know, smoking before coming over here. It changes the heart rate. Heart rate will change definitely cardiac output, and the outcome will be the cardiac output definitely increases the blood pressure. The chances are there there will be definitely wrong recording of that. Now talking about the devices, uh, many many devices have been talked about. The classical are three which are definitely mercury sphygmomanometer, the classical one not yet to be deposited in the, in the museum. And number two is aneroid sphygmomanometer have got certain concerns in the talk as well. And then digital, a more convenient, portable automated unit. That's also very good. That's also being used as well. Now, how the blood pressure is measured. When a cuff is wrapped around a patient's upper arm and inflated, the brachial artery is occluded. This is a standard. I have talked about the anti-cubital fossa, but uh, I'll also point one important significant anatomical site as well, that if you are unable to uh, properly locate the anti-cubital fossa, uh, sometimes it happens, then you can use the medial epicondyle, medial epicondyle of the lower end of the humerus. So that is also considered as one of those points from which we can go proximally upwards, that is about 2.5 centimeter, and that should be considered at the lower edge of the curve. So these two points are extraordinarily important. So because the cubital fossa is basically uh, uh, one of the assumption that this is the cubital fossa, then uh, you can definitely fold the arm and you can straighten it out, you can find it out. Now locating the brachial artery, this is also very, very important. In most of the patients, you can locate the brachial artery. The uh, anatomical position is that if you look at the insertion of this uh, brachial, uh, this uh, this uh, biceps muscle, uh, just medial to it is the brachial artery. So it means if you just hold the arm and then bend it, then straighten it out, you will be able to find out the point of insertion of this biceps muscle. And then just medial to it, if you, you go parallel to it, you can find out the brachial artery. So this is one thing by which uh, you can do. And uh, uh, this blood pressure, it is recommended that before proceeding for this uh, uh, method, that is the auscultatory method, you should go for the palpatory method first. This will give you a rough idea that what is the likely blood pressure, that the systolic pressure in this patient. You go on inflating the cuff by uh, you just wrapping it, and then you go on feeling the, uh, this, uh, the pulsating artery, that is the brachial artery, and ultimately a point comes when it is occluded, you are unable to, to feel its palpation, and then you go about 20 to 30 millimeter higher than that, 
and afterward you deflate the cup uh, gradually and then coming down you can feel it again so the first point is that on the palpitatory method when you are inflating it and then there is occlusion of the brachial artery and you are unable to find out the pulse that is considered to be the rough method by which you can say that this is the uh, the, the the palpitatory method for taking the blood pressure so this will give you a rough idea that uh, how far you are going to inflate your cup when you are heading towards the auscultatory method this is one now coming towards the point that uh, uh, steps of measuring taking the blood pressure we uh, we have to look them critically please try to concentrate on these points patient's arm should be supported i have talked about that putting the forearm on the table that is the best way at the heart level heart level is very significant once you are tying the cup then his back should be supported patient shouldn't be bending forward and uh, in a bad posture might be using extra muscle to support and maintain that posture Similarly, legs legs should be uncrossed and feet on the floor. Your upper arm should be bare with sleeve comfortably rolled down. We have seen people taking the blood pressure on a coat, on a tight clothing. Then don't expect that this is going to give the uh, this uh, appropriate you know this reading. Then similarly, medical personnel should wrap the blood pressure cuff snugly around your upper arm around eighty percent. 80% of the total arm circumference if it is considered as 100% then we have to wrap it apart for, for about 80% the lower edge of the cup should be 1 inch that is 2.5 cm above the bend of your elbow above the antecubital fossa and i have talked to uh, about another anatomical point that is the median epicondyle so this is also very important lesson the cup must be inflated quickly either by pumping the or squeezing the bulb or pushing the button patient should feel tightness around his or her arm next the value also valve of the cup should open slightly along the pressure to slowly fall if you uh, deflate the cup uh, very very rapidly then chances are that you are going to get low pressure but if you are uh, lowering uh, this uh, blood pressure deep by deflation uh, very 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 slowly then probably there is a chance that you might be getting the recording of high blood pressure so what is the standard standard is that if you deflate the cuff by 2 to 3 cm per second this is extraordinarily important now talking about the gorotkov's arms gorotkov was basically one of the russian scientists and he uh, uh, found out that there are five types of different arms Uh, what are those points i would say not the sounds number 1 is k1 k2 k3 k4 and k5 now k1 is considered once you are deflating the cuff there is uh, immediately and uh, this uh, uh, appearance of the first sound appearance of the first sound this is called k1 now it increases in its intensity this is k2 then it decreases in its intensity that is k3 and k4 is considered as the muffling of the sound and k5 is the point where you might not be able to listen any so these are five points important there is a consensus that uh, once you are not able to listen not able to listen that's the k5 people say that k4 is significant but k5 is taken as the point which is uh, as the diastolic pressure as soon as the heart pumps its blood it comes definitely with a greater pressure and then ultimately the valve is closed aortic valve is closed then the aorta which was initially dilated it comes back and maintains the blood pressure and then there are are arterioles present at the end which are basically responsible and being maintained controlled by the autonomic nervous system and creating the pressure over there so this pressure is maintained when we are talking about the mean arterial pressure we are talking about the pressure which is maintained during the systole and diastole that is the mean arterial pressure and uh, usually it is calculated by the diastolic pressure plus the one third of pulse pressure so this is around 90 to 93 this is considered as so this is responsible for maintenance of the flow of blood maintenance of the perfusion in different tissues of the body 
so these are five sounds i have talked about the dog for odd cough sound and these are basically diagrammatically represented over here you can see at the lower, lower area that uh, once there is uh, this uh, systolic uh, pressure for example it is 145 and then there is a uh, this uh, high intensity sound the uh, oscillometric sound that comes slightly at the lower range and then coming at uh, decreased intensity and then muffling up the sound and then there is disappearance so we can see it in different phases this is also interpreted over here so there is a silence tapping sound phase one uh, soft swishing sound then crisp sound blowing sound and then is the silence at different levels like we can see at 120 110 100 90 and 80 so these are different phases which must be considered in one of the diagram you can see that uh, there is a flow of blood coming in then you basically tighten it out there is no blood passing through it now from coming towards the point where blood is passing but yet the artery is squeezed and later on is a point when the blow uh, uh, this flow of blood has actually start again these phases are diagrammatically represented into other phases now uh, i'll show you yeah, this is how these phases begin yeah. that's it No voice being heard. Can 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 you? No voice. That? No 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 sound. So the voice of Kotak of sounds and these phases are not being uh, audibleized. Issue, but I can listen. Okay. Okay. So at least you're continuing with presentation. Okay. Okay. It's all right. So I I hope I was able to make the concept uh, clear to everybody that there are five phases and this is how the broad pop sounds these can be uh, assumed. Now uh, heading towards the uh, various phases when we are thinking about the auscultatory method. So uh, definitely tapping sound, murmur sound, banging sound, muffled, and and this is just for the clarity of the concept. But before I proceed further, I'll show you an other uh, this uh, video. Hopefully, I'll try to make the sound more loud and audible. I make it hundred percent. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. But the voice is not so clear. It is not audible. Okay. Okay. Uh, I should switch over. <laughs> I should go over. So you can find it uh, even on Google yes. and you can search if at all you are going to do with that. So heading towards the other things, uh, these are uh, various uh, uh, you know these devices 
sometimes your wrist devices is used sometimes finger devices are used now finger devices are just like uh, as we are using nowadays this uh, uh, pulse oximeter it's just like this you can put it on this apply it on the finger and uh, there is continuous do 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 this reading uh, it is only uh, recommended once the other chances of utilization of these devices are possible or you want to continuously monitor it so you can use finger devices you can this device now uh, there are different positions which you have to do uh, time and again uh, in some of the patient for example there is a difference between the blood pressure of both arms once you are coming across a patient for the first time then it's always advisable that you take the blood pressure on both the arms and sometimes if you find that there is a young person of about for example 15 years and 20 years and you find that there is a high pressure then even the blood pressure in the lower limb is also recommended for example in case of coarctation of the aorta so in that case one might be able to see high pressure in the arms and there could be a low pressure in the lower limb so this is very very important and you can even palpate the pulses and the femoral pulses could not be as uh, appropriately uh, you know felt as this is not the practical person but even in adults if they are coming for the first time taking the blood pressure on both the both the arms is so important Uh, because uh, there could be difference of about 8 to 10 or 20 or 30 systolic pressure or diastolic pressure so the higher side should be considered as well so in the end i'll show you how the blood pressure recording is documented this is very important it means that you should write down the blood pressure systolic diastolic then you should write down the position of the person while you took the blood pressure in spine in sitting or in standing while you took the blood pressure on right arm or on the left arm this is very very important when you are documenting so that if you document that his left arm giving the higher pressure as compared to right arm time and again it is always to be documented so that it has to be monitored later on in life that on the higher side the blood pressure is used as one of the monitor now uh, this is another uh, thigh pressure i have told you and uh, similarly leg pressure leg pressure is sometimes used in case of uh, ankle brachial index in patients who are suffering from this peripheral arterial diseases and we are coming across patients suffering from all these things like the diabetes light uh, diabetic foot then uh, uh, this thigh pressure uh, sorry leg pressure is also very very important and for that uh, reason the special equipment is there that is the doppler and by which we can take the blood pressure on the corresponding side of the arm on one side corresponding side of the leg on the same side and similarly on the left right and left both sides that has to be monitored again that has to be documented and then we take the ratio out of it so normally the ankle pressure is higher than the arm pressure but in case of peripheral arterial diseases this ratio could be reversed it could be less than 1 so that will give you the idea or the impact that for example a patient has a diabetic this uh, this vasculopathy on the left side then definitely you are going to get different ratio on the left side as compared to right so that is to be documented similarly in a child devices is definitely slightly different but it's a very challenging thing that you are going to take the blood pressure on a child and it is recommended that if it's not possible and the child is not cooperative then you can only rely on palpatory method at least systolic blood pressure you can give your right during exercise of course uh, we have talked about it uh, and we have looked at much of it previous the previous talk and then white coat hypertension definitely these are the different reasons like white coat hypertension that self monitoring of the blood pressure at home that is the self measured blood pressure monitoring that is recommended and similarly ambulatory by monitoring of the blood pressure these are two things because many of the patient due to this white coat threat or anxiety they used to have a high reading due to this reason we need now uh, what is happening around the clock with the patient so this is ambulatory uh, monitoring of the blood pressure of self uh, this uh, major blood pressure monitoring so these are two two important so thigh is also important if you want to take the blood pressure in the lower limb then uh, definitely you'll have to put the patient in prone position 
you apply the cuff above the uh, this uh, this bend of this knee and then you uh, basically look for the popliteal artery so similar all things are applied as if these are used in the arm the only thing is that the size of the cuff could be different then taking the blood pressure in children we have talked about exercise we have uh, talked about definitely that gives you an idea about the prognosis of the patient and what will uh, going to happen to the patient in future uh, arm position yes we have talked about office measurement yes uh, dr george has given a good idea home measurement of blood pressure i'll just skip the slides uh, standing pressure yes uh, uh, dr george told us that taking the blood pressure in standing is useless and it's not uh, to be uh, uh, to be monitored but uh, definitely he also pointed out as uh, if you want to see a uh, change of orthostatic hypotension in few of the patients like autonomic neuropathy diabetics are those patients who are taking the uh, this anti hypertensive drug especially alpha blockers or uh, uh, vasodilators and those patients might need this standing pressure as well and there are certain rules to to be followed number one is you take the blood pressure in spine position you just keep the this cuff wrapped up then ask the patient to stand up take the blood pressure again then keep waiting for about 2 minutes time take the blood pressure again so uh, normally there are baro receptors present in the aorta they uh, give you a sensitivity when the patient stand up. a normal person stands up then definitely just after standing these reflexes uh, bring us so brisk change that signals they pass into the brain and then cardio acceleratory center and pressure center they are basically affected and due to this is a normal human being can maintain the blood pressure but if one has got this autonomic neuropathy diabetes a patient taking the blood uh, this uh, anti hypertensive drug which may basically dilate the vessels uh, like you know dilators then the chances are that one may be getting this uh, uh, chances of uh, this orthostatic hypertension and we might be expecting syncopal attacks in those patients if it is definitely no so this is how you can take the standing blood pressure now coming towards the leg pressure i talked about much then sleep it yes dr char told us a white coat hypertension uh, yes uh, yes one is the invasive method invasive is uh, if you want to uh, you know this uh, monitor the blood pressure uh, and you are not able to record the blood pressure which normally are recorded by indirect way then you can use the cannula and uh, this is again basically joint with oscillometry and you can have this blood pressure recorded so this is how the cannula is inserted uh, these are certain indications that is continuous real time blood pressure monitoring sometimes uh, intra uh, this vascular excess this uh, gives you the idea then is plant pharmacologic or mechanical cardio Uh, this vascular manipulation or repeated blood sampling sometimes is needed failure so definitely this is done in critically ill patients ambulatory method yes we have talked about much yes now coming towards the guidelines i'm coming towards the end so please concentrate upon these guidelines these are taken from the kaplan who is authority uh, basically in hypertension world over so there are certain uh, i would say dimensions which can give you a normal pressure recording or there are certain aspects and dimensions which can give you an error so there are patient condition number one posture initially particularly more than 65 years with diabetes are receiving anti hypertensive therapy check for postural changes i have talked about this now so this are these are written in the guideline then taking the readings after 5 minutes fine then immediately in 2 minutes after standing for routine follow up the patient should sit quietly with the arm bared and supported at the level of the heart and the back resting against a chair the length of time before measurement is uncertain but most guidelines recommend 5 minutes we are we have talked about as well now coming towards the circumference no caffeine circumstances sorry no caffeine or smoking within 30 minutes preceding the reading if a patient has just thrown away the cigarette before entering the clinic ask him to sit sit for about uh, half an hour because the chances are that the uh, uh, this uh, nicotine this increases the heart rate the chances are that there will falsely high recording of the blood pressure so ask you to sit quietly for about half an hour there is no harm and similarly it should be a quiet room this should be not not a noisy and a conducive environment for the patient 
Similarly, equipment cuff size, the bladder should encircle at least 80% of the circumference and cover two thirds of the length of the arm. A too small bladder may cause falsely high risk. Manometer, either a mercury recently calibrated aneroid or validated electronic device can be used. Stethoscope, the bell of the stethoscope should be used and avoid excess bell pressure. The bell is very important because uh, that can give you all the frequency of sounds and definitely all the intensities. Just that I have talked about the sounds, so those can be better audible with the bell as compared to the data. Now, infants use ultrasound or Doppler method. Technique: number of readings on each occasion. Take at least two readings separated by as much as time as is practical. If readings vary more than five millimeter of mercury. तो आपको तसली से उनकी ब्लड प्रेशर की रिकॉर्डिंग करनी है एंड टेक एडिशनल रीडिंग्स अंटिल टू आर क्लोज फॉर डायग्नोसिस ऑब्टेन थ्री सेट्स ऑफ रीडिंग्स एट लीस्ट वन वीक अपार्ट इनिशियली टेक ब्लड प्रेशर इन बोथ आर्म्स इफ द प्रेशर डिफर यूज द आर्म विद द हायर प्रेशर इफ द आर्म प्रेशर इज एलिवेटेड टेक द प्रेशर इन वन लेग पर्टिकुलरली इन पेशेंट्स लेस देन 30 इयर्स ओल्ड आई हैव टॉक्ड अबाउट सम कैनिटल एनोमली सेल्स टेक्निक Performance: Initially, uh, inflate the bladder quickly to a pressure 20 millimeter of mercury above the systolic pressure. Recognize by the disappearance of the radial pulse to avoid an auscultatory gap. Uh, yes, about the auscultatory gap, I would say sometimes there is appearance of uh, this sound and then it goes away, and then comes an other sound after 20 or 30 uh, this uh, millimeter of mercury. So uh, people might be missing the first sound. Uh, then these patients they have got false recording of the blood pressure and they are not being treated so this uh, auscultatory gap has got some significance and must be given priority so one must be able to try to find out the first sound and then if there is a gap and there is a second sound this is also called as uh, uh, this is also called as silent gap deflate the bladder 3 mm uh, mm of mercury per second 3 is average otherwise 2 to 3 is okay If you uh, come, uh, you know, quickly, the chances are that there will be lesser or lower recording of the blood pressure. Record the carotid cuffs of phase one appearance and phase five disappearance. If the carotid cuff sounds are weak, have the patient raise the arm, open and close the hand five to ten times. Clinching, उसको करवा दे. ऐसे उसका कहें कि बाजू ऊपर करे और five to ten times जो है, उसे कहें कि इस तरह opening and closing, opening and closing. The chances are that you might be able to listen. With more clarity and inflate the blood blood flow. Uh, recordings. ये बहुत important चीज़ है. I've just talked about कि जब आपने blood pressure को record करना है, तो हम units से दूर की बात, uh, sorry, बाकी चीज़ों दूर की बात है. बाद का unit भी नहीं लिखते. 120 बटा 80. So this is mostly written. अगर ये लिखा भी होगा, तो बोलने में हम millimeter भर के नहीं लिखेंगे. So recording should be like this. Note the pressure. patient position the arm and the cuff size this is very very important so this is not only important that you are following the sops but this is one of the documented proof that the any other person any other health professional in a follow up if he is taking the blood pressure he will take the consideration of all these things before writing the blood pressure and taking the blood pressure bhaiya so he will take the consideration of that arm आप अगर कभी किसी का राइट या लेफ्ट आर्म लिखेंगे तो वो समझ जाएगा दैट दिस इज द हायर साइड सो दिस इज इंपॉर्टेंट दैट यू राइट डाउन द 140 ओवर 90 सीटेड राइट आर्म एंड लार्ज एडल्ट कप रेस्पेक्टिवली एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर गिविंग अटेंशन एंड लिसनिंग टू माय फ्यू ऑफ द थिंग्स व्हिच आई आई फील दैट दिस अपीयर टू बी सिग्निफिकेंट एक्सपीरियंस थैंक यू वेरी थैंक यू वेरी मच प्रोफेसर मुनीर अजर for your excellent presentation and definitely we went through a lot of uh, lacunas which most of the general practitioners and even other doctors face on measuring and taking the blood pressure accurately and especially this was a very uh, i i would say enlightening talk for especially our pgrs registrars and also all other doctors so what i would like to ask you is that how often do you see the auscultatory gap professor harun if i may interrupt you first we have to show you the poll result and then we will continue the discussion okay okay
Yes, uh, Professor Adar, sorry for intervening early in, earlier in, in your talk. Uh, how often do you come across this auscultatory gap in your uh, uh, practice, clinical practice? Uh, sir, uh, basically, uh, uh, if we uh, consider the common population, it's not very, very uh, significantly noted. I would say, could it be around uh, one to two percent of the population? But if specifically, then patients suffering from systemic sclerosis, it is uh, almost, uh, I would say, 25 to 30 percent of the patients, they may have got the silent gap. This is very significant. Right, Professor. Other thing is that, especially in elderly patients, we come across a pseudo type of hypertension. And is it due to the calcification of the arteries or is it uh, uh, the, the dis disentibility, disensibility of the arteries is also decreased in the elderly population? And th this is what uh, we have uh, seen uh, in the studies. Your, your comments? That's it. Sir, sir, basically, two, both the things are important. In elderly patient due to atherosclerosis, definitely the elasticity is less. The chances are that these patients, they have got this uh, higher cysts of systolic and lower diastolic, and the gap is more. So that, this basically reflects that the patient, they have got this uh, atherosclerosis. And what you are talking about is sens uh, sensitivity. That is also one of the important aspects in elderly patients that they are considered as uh, having hypertension, but this is pseudo -hypertension. Thank you. Professor Azhar, you said that the healthcare professional should apply cuff around 80% of the arm. Actually, it is not the cuff, it is the bladder which should encircle 80%. And cuff yeah, actually yeah. goes around the arm, and yeah, you should yeah, have yeah. the right size of the cuff so that it encircles at least 80%. True, true, sir. True. Can I ask something? Yeah, please do. First of all, uh, thank you very much, Professor Muni Razar, and you were awesome and excellent as always. My question is uh, not to Professor uh, Muni Azar only, but to all the uh, senior faculty members, uh, Professor Harun and my mentor and teacher, Professor Az Azizur Rahman. We are constantly uh, asking everybody to take blood pressure while sitting on a chair and uh, there should be a table in front of you and you should be placing the sphygmomanometer or any device which you want to use over there. Most of us, we examine our patients while they are supine and we have uh, pasted or placed our sphygmomanometer on the wall at the level of patient's uh, heart and we monitor blood pressure while their arms are flat towards you, at the same level as heart and sphygmomanometer base. Why we want to shift our patient, examine on a supine position and then make them sit on another place and then check the blood pressure. How much is the variability in supine blood pressures and uh, blood pressure which we are recording by this method in our clinical practice, can anybody uh, give me some more insight? Uh, thank you very much for asking this question. Uh, uh, but def definitely, Harun Babar Sahib definitely can give us more wisdom. So I refer this. Yes, sir. Uh, I think what uh, what you are talking about is a patient while supine and patient while sitting. I think there is not much difference. The difference may be around 5 mmHg in systolic and not more than that if, he's in, if, if the technique is correct and uh, if the conditions are correct and the patient is at rest at least 10 to 15 minutes, he has not taken any drug or he has not taken any, uh, uh, any sort of uh, liquid with caffeine. So this is what I think practically. But uh, uh, Professor George is here and they may elaborate further. I think he left probably. And if I may respond to this, sure. Uh, whatever physics I Professor, know. I Professor think... George is with us. Um, I think I can okay. see him. Okay. Like, he can... has his response after mine. Right. Right. I think, uh, I think that as far as the physics is concerned, uh, the, the level of the arm where you apply the cuff, that needs to be at heart level. 
that may be patient may be in the sitting position or supine or lying as long as the part of the arm where you are applying the cuff is at heart level you are getting the right readings blood pressure apparatus may be at whatever level that doesn't really matter so the second part is although in some cases the taking blood pressure in supine position may be okay like patient is admitted we do ward rounds and nurse mostly take blood pressure in the supine but all guidelines they explicitly say that when you label somebody hypertensive so that reading should be when patient is sitting up in a comfortable chair with backrest and legs hang so there may be some difference but we i think continue to follow the guidelines sir i have uh, i have uh, searched for this uh, in past few days uh, especially for uh, uh, checking the uh, difference in supine and sitting the only thing which comes forward is first there is no more difference in these readings and secondly if a patient is comfortable as harun said and as all guidelines are saying then probably it does not better the only concern of mine was that it becomes it becomes technically difficult that examine a patient on supine position and then ask him to sit on a chair and then wait for 5 minutes that he should be more comfortable sitting on that chair and then record blood pressure can we do that technically clinically or otherwise this was my basic concern and most of the guidelines they just say that this is best to record on in the sitting position position i do believe and we do follow the guidelines but can anybody answer that is it so important that we should follow 100% this uh, technique or we can modify it according to our own uh, uh, assess, assessment technique in our I, own I would okay, professor but, george have, but, professor george yeah okay thank you i'd like to make a general, general comment that the recommendations we give for oscillatory measurement are for 50 decades for 50 years five decades which means that uh, we have failed to follow them for quite long time and i'm pessimist about the future this is why the guidelines now recommend automated measurement one uh, second all guidelines say sitting blood pressure so we stick with sitting blood pressure so we look at if you look at the experiments comparing sitting standing and lying um there is little difference between sitting and supine if you have 100 people all together but in some people there can be a difference particularly in the elderly and when there is um uh, autonomic dysfunction but the recommendation to use uh, guidelines is sitting blood pressure the last issue i'd like to say is we are discussing about blood pressure measurement So there are two chapters here. One is that blood pressure is a vital sign, and the other is blood pressure is a is a risk factor, and we want to control it. So if you are in the emergency and you are measuring blood pressure as a vital sign, who cares about five millimeters mercury? Who cares about ten millimeters mercury? I want to know whether my patient has fifty, one hundred, one hundred fifty, or two hundred. All these details that Professor. just the presented about the spectator measurement is about hypertension where we have 130 and we want to go 125 and we need an accuracy of 5 not 50 mm mercury so it's a different when you are discussing about hypertension management or blood pressure as a vital sign may I ask one question yes sir Mr. So Judge, uh, is there any significance of recording mean arterial blood pressure as as a uh, say tool of uh, our management? And secondly, where would we be going on for invasive uh, blood pressure recording? So it's situation like we are talking about very stiff and at the arteriosclerotic vessels. So would our uh, this auscultatory or automated reading be valid? So uh, I like to have your comment on that. So for mean blood pressure this is a valuable hemodynamic parameter however the problem is that all the recommendations we have for clinical management of hypertension have been based on systolic and diastolic 
Also, it is important to remember that the electronic devices, the oscillometric devices, which we now recommend for both office and out of office measurements, actually measure one thing, mean blood pressure. They measure mean blood pressure at the level of the maximum oscillation. Then they have a mathematical algorithm and they look at the oscillometric curve and try to estimate with a mathematical formula systolic and diastolic, but in fact, they do measure mean blood pressure. So mean blood pressure, as you pointed out, it's very important, but for clinical practice, we have to go for systolic and diastolic. So for intraarterial measurement, no question, this is the measurement. This is the only measurement. What happens in the artery? Anything else we do out of the other is estimating blood pressure. However, as I said, it's a different blood pressure measurement, different than the calf blood pressure, and it's only used for uh, lab conditions, invasive techniques, and this is about tracking blood pressure changes. You're not looking at five millimeters mercury. You want to see the hemodynamic condition of your patient, which goes to very high or low. You, need, you don't have thresholds there uh, as we have for hypertension. Okay, thank you. thank you. I think we are now ready with the comparison of the pre-test and post-test. We'll display them and I will request Professor Munin as to comment if there has been some improvement. <clears throat> so uh, if we go for the pre-test poll, uh, the right cup size for the average adult is considered to be so pre-test was 38% and it rose up to 46%. Uh, so there's improvement. Next, yes, please. <laughs> definitely. Next slide. Uh, yes, there is a remarkable improvement. A lot of improvement. B played the cup. That was right. initially 40% and now 66%. Right. Next, please. Uh, it was 38% uh, pre-test poll, the bladder of the cup by percentage should at least encircle the arm and now it is 62 that is 80 percent very good improvement is good. yes so message well conveyed next please yes yes uh, this is really conveyed over here pre-test poll led to uh, this was 58 percent and now it is 83 mashallah going there <laughs> that's great Alhamdulillah. So, thank you very much so there sorry is a professor here. george we couldn't do it well in your case so uh, uh, we were having some trouble in showing this as us, but this time I think we managed to do it. It was a fruitful discussion, <laughs> and we learned a lot from Professor Haru. Please to, as well as from you to conclude the session now. Please conclude the session. Uh, I think time so is it up. It was a very useful uh, meeting. It was a very useful and enlightened discussion, and the presentations were up to the mark and excellent presentations. And I think uh, we all learned, even if somebody learned a little, we all learn uh, and we are always learning. And we will keep on with this uh, type of discussions in the future. And uh, it's great to have people like these among us who can, uh, who can throw a light on the latest developments and uh, the treatments as well as the techniques of blood pressure. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Azizur Rahman, Professor Tariq Wasim, Dr. Sohail Tariq, Professor Munir Azhar, and last but not the least, Professor George, for, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for enlightening us with all your comments and your presentation. Thank you, uh, thank very you much. so much for, uh, you much. for your wonderful presentations. Please, Somia, uh, please, Dr. Somia, do you want to say something? Uh, on behalf of Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine, I would like to thank both my speakers. Uh, a one, one request from all the panelists, all the attendees, and all the speakers that we are uh, we have to stick to the time. So I would request everybody, all the panelists, to please stick to one question so that we can give more chance to the participants who are attending this course. And also to answer the questions in the chat box by typing in order to save time. I would be requesting my speakers to stick to the time as well. Thank you very much for an excellent session, Professor George and Professor Munir Azhar. We will inshallah see you 
next time sunday at 12 well, dr dr soni i just let me thank uh, mr kashif riaz and atco for organizing such a beautiful session so this course i would not have been possible without the support of atco so we are all very grateful to atco and especially to mr kashif riaz and dr shirin who have joined in all the sessions thank you very much goodbye Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.